I'm not sure that um, many of you will know the name Simon Owen, uh, but he was world famous uh, right from the very top of the North Island of New Zealand right to the bottom of um, Stewart Island and uh, maybe even in other parts of the world as well. Uh, in 2014, he won the PGA, uh, that's golf, um, Seniors Open. And uh, his other claim to fame for us Australians is that his brother is a Presbyterian minister um, just down the road in Point Cook. Uh, and another claim to fame he's got is that he won the nine, or sorry, he almost won the 1978 uh, British Open Golf Championship. I think he was leading to about the 17th hole and then got um, pipped at the post by Jack Nicholas. Uh, one more claim to fame that he's got is, I think it was um, Ken, but uh, I could be proven wrong on that, one of my sons uh, actually broke one of those golf clubs that he played uh, in, with in the British Open. Uh, but Simon said something very interesting and um, something that's actually, I think, quite apparently true. And that is that when you are winning, that everybody wants to give you everything. And so there is a high-profile golfer. When he was winning the golf, uh, people, he not only got the prize pool, which was significant, of course, but people wanted to provide him with a car to drive. They wanted to provide him with a hotel room. They wanted to have his face on this sponsorship and that sponsorship, and they were just queuing up to give the winner uh, their goods and the opportunities and to throw their money at him. But he said... When you are losing, and this happens very, very quickly, it very suddenly all goes south. Nobody wants to know you, nobody cares, everybody disappears. And he said it's strange because uh, that's actually the time when you need the help and the assistance and the, the encouragement. But when things are going hard for you, then nobody wants to know you at all. <clears throat> and we use uh, the expression... Uh, of that as riding on somebody's coattails, don't we? Uh, it's the idea that when somebody is flying high that you sort of uh, grab on behind them and that you're swept along and trying to grab a little bit of their glory, a little bit of their acclaim and a little bit of the excitement of what is happening. And when you are winning, everyone, uh, so they tell me, uh, wants to tag along with you. And this is what we see here in the Gospel of Luke happening to Jesus. We see there uh, here that there is this sense of excitement, this sense of thrill, this wonder and delight at what is happening as they uh, start to get the idea of who Jesus really is. And with that incredible uh, pithy, crystallized statement that Peter comes out with in the end of it in verse 20. You are the Christ of God. You are the Christ of God. And of course, uh, these words are crystallizing the thought and the point of all that we've been looking at coming up to this, all that Luke has been presenting to us. Uh, we've had all of these stories about Jesus in the first eight chapters and here is the crescendo, here is the summary of it, here is the point of it, that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, uh, the name that is used to designate him as the one who is the Messiah uh, from the Old Testament. We've been uh, going constantly back to um, chapter 1 and the first four verses, and it speaks there uh, that Luke is saying that he's going to write down the things that are fulfilled. Well, this is crystallizing all of that, isn't it? Here we see the Christ, the promised Savior, the one that people had been longing for, uh, the Christ of God. Uh, this is what separates him. This is what takes it from uh, being a biography of just somebody who was a significant um, human leader to the, uh, the focus of all of history. And so the disciples are coming along here for the ride of their lives. They're seeing the things that Jesus is doing. They are hearing the things that Jesus is saying. And the excitement just rises until we get to this glorious declaration. But we need to see 
this glorious declaration, not just in isolation, but within the context that Jesus himself gives to it. The context that Jesus gives to it. Jesus wants to tell them that, yes, it is true. Peter is right. He is the Christ. But if they follow him, if they follow him, it won't all be tight lines and smooth sailing. The, uh, this high point of the declaration as Jesus is the Christ, Jesus deliberately links that in to his suffering, to, self, to, to suffering, not just his suffering, uh, to self-denial, to self-sacrifice, which will be followed by glory uh, of the Son of Man, of which we they get a, a glimpse in the next recorded events as it goes on uh, from this passage that we look at this morning to the transfiguration. So firstly, we see here the riding of the coattails of Jesus to blessing. Uh, Jesus asks the question, who do the crowd say that I am in verse 18? And of course, the question has uh, as I've already started to say, been very close to the surface as we've been looking through Luke. Uh, all of those stories were pointed towards this end to show who Jesus is. And at the end of chapter 8, uh, even if you just look back at the headings that you've got there in, the, in your Bibles, uh, we see that they are filled with wonder at what Jesus does as he raises someone to life. And the obvious question is, who is this man who can do such things? Who is Jesus? This is an act that God alone can do. And so it's no wonder that the whole of society, from the very top to the very bottom of society, is stirred up by these events. And we have uh, the crowds of common people coming to Jesus. But also, if we'd read uh, a little earlier in Luke chapter 9 and verse 7... Uh, even Herod the Tetrarch had heard about what was happening and was perplexed. Um, his concern was raised partly by his guilty conscience because he had had John the Baptist uh, put to death and he was wondering if it was John the Baptist who was coming back um, to spook him out of it. Uh, but the, and so the disciples reply to Jesus' question about who he is and they say, well, some people, um, they say, you're John the Baptist. Others say you are Elijah, uh, and still others, one of the prophets from long ago that has come back to life. The, the whole of society is asking that question of who he is. Um, people who have been blessed by his ministry are asking that question because it is obvious that he is somebody who is more than just a leader of the time, a person who has done some interesting things. Uh, but perhaps even more powerfully when people like Herod, the Tetrarch, the ruler, asks that question and says there is more going on here with this man than what meets the eye. And of course, uh, as expected, the uh, disciples have a greater insight. Uh, they recognize that here, the things that is, Jesus has been doing, the things that he has been saying, are pointing to who he intrinsically is as the Messiah. This is the one that the prophets have spoken about. This is the one that the 400 years since the last prophet spoke, uh, that the, the nation of Israel has been waiting for. This is the one who is the Christ of God. <clears throat> And so as uh, Luke has said, he wants to talk about the fulfillment that is happening amongst them uh, in the early verses of, of the book. Uh, this is the peak of it. This is what the whole Old Testament has been looking forward to. This has been the flow of history since the Garden of Eden. Here is the solution to life and eternity. We're not talking about small things here. Uh, this is changing the course of history. This is the focus of that history of the world. And at this point, if we were following the line of the uh, prosperity gospel heretics, 
and the peddlers of uh, feel-good religion, then we would say, here is Jesus. Here is the wonder of who he is. Uh, here is all the feel-good emotions that you could ever want to have and ever experience. Come to Jesus and he will solve all your problems and he will make you overflow with joy all the time. And there, there will be uh, just peace and wonder and your new car and your new home and your, uh, you will suddenly look in the mirror and uh, hardly be able to recognize yourself because of how beautiful you look and your prosperity and your health and all of the dreams that you could have ever imagined. And it's an attractive proposition, isn't it? To see Jesus as the Christ, as the fulfillment of all history and to say if he is so wonderful and if he is for me, then Let's just make this all about the good things that can happen in my life and that's the sort of news I want to hear. And we are very self-centred, aren't we? Uh, not that long ago we had an election, um, was it 12 months ago? Um, and uh, Scott Morrison in his election, um, in, in his uh, victory speech said, uh, I believe in miracles. Uh, what would have happened, and the, the, the whole Liberal Party room, obviously, uh, burst into applause and so they were all delighted about it. What would have happened, though, if he had st stood up as the leader of the, t the time, the one who was the winner and said, I believe in miracles and now you are going to suffer for following me? Uh, that's not really a very good political message anymore, is it? Uh, I'll leave you to consider whether that's actually how it's worked out or not, uh, but that's not the point that we're looking at. Uh, but Jesus does exactly that here. We come to this incredible peak of joy, of excitement, of wonder. This is who he is. And then he deliberately takes us on to riding his co coattails, not to just blessing but also to suffering and you can look there in the text and see how uh, directly deliberately it is our text breaks it up by putting in headings which aren't a part of the original text and and you might think that uh, we're going on to something separate in verse 21 but it's not is it he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this that is that he is the Christ of God to no one saying so we don't get a, a chance to make, say, oh, this is a different topic, but saying, the Son of Man must suffer. And he goes on in that line. And so he deliberately connects it into this suffering. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Well, Jesus, what a way to bring the party down. What a way to take that excitement, that thrill, that joy and put an absolute damper on it. And then he goes on, if that's not bad enough, to spread the prediction of suffering beyond himself to those who are listening. Not just to the disciples, but look at verse 23. And he said to, to all, if... Whoa, losing my glasses. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would come after me, and that means it's not just the disciples, but it's you and it's me as well. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus, we just thought we were on this, uh, this trend to glory, to wonder, to splendor, to just the pure excitement and delight of who you are. And here we see that if we're going to be a part of this train, then we're going to be there in the suffering as well. And of course, that must have seemed somewhat a nonsense saying to the disciples when he says, uh, take up your cross, mustn't it? Uh, they didn't know anything about shiny silver or gold uh, crosses that you'd hang around your neck or anything like that. Uh, the, the cross to them was just a, a terrible instrument of torture. Uh, the only people who died on the cross were the desperately wicked people, the cursed people. Uh, there was a reason that they were treated with that vile and filthy instrument, that object of horror. It's, this, it's the, the peak symbol 
of being outside of the glory of God and the blessing of God. But Jesus says, uh, you are going to have to take up that filthy, rotten, stinking cross upon yourself. Deny yourself if you want to follow me. Now, when it comes to suffering, there are, of course, many reasons for suffering. Um, Sometimes it's our own foolishness. Sometimes it's just the nature of the world that we are in, uh, a disrupted world by sin. Uh, But here we also see that uh, that for the Christian, suffering comes because we are united with Christ. He says, I'm going to suffer, and if you're going to follow me, then there is going to be suffering for you as well. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Uh, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That sounds good, Uh, but it goes on. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And that all still sounds good. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You see, to be united, united with Jesus means that he is everything to you. And he tests that relationship. Uh, it's sad that uh, it is being tested and, and there is real sorrow in, in it being tested. But it's being tested uh, in this way, in, a ver- in, in this day, in a very obvious way, isn't it? within our own state and in New South Wales and and over large parts of the country uh, through the bushfires. We have Christian friends who have lost almost everything and they seem to be coping very well with that. But that's a real point of proof, isn't it? If everything is taken away, if the house is destroyed, if the memories are destroyed, the possessions are destroyed, the shed is destroyed, the boats are destroyed, everything is gone. But Jesus remains. And and Jesus has proven in their lives that he is more important, that he is there, that he sustains them even when everything else is gone. He proved that, of course, to Job, didn't he? He proved it uh, so that we could see it, we could see the importance of, uh, of the, the Lord in the life of a man like Job when, when he took away his wife, when he took away his family, when he took away his business and uh, yet he continued to follow the Lord and f- refused to curse the Lord. And the devil was proven to be wrong that, uh, there were, that these things were so important to Job that Job would curse God when they were gone. But Job, uh, through his trust in the Lord, uh, the Lord, through his holding on to Job, proved that he himself was the one who would bring satisfaction, that he himself was enough in the midst of suffering. You see, if your life is ruined because you lose your job, then your job was your security, obviously. If your life is ruined because uh, you lose your money, then obviously it was your money that was your security. Um, Sometimes it doesn't come up in such big things, though, does it? Uh, If you are impatient and if you're uh, just saying, oh, why is this so that that person within the church has to be grumpy about everything? Well, what does it say here? Jesus says, take up that cross. You shouldn't be surprised that somebody would give you a little bit of a problem along the way. Uh, Just take it up. Take up that cross, deny yourself and keep on pursuing. This is a part of the cost of being a Christian. If your elders, you think, have made a bad decision, well, uh, okay, I mean, you know, this isn't all there is to do. You can talk to them and all the rest of it, but take up that, that cross. It's a part of the suffering. It's a part of being a part of the body of Christ. If it's a neighbor that you're trying to minister to and yet they keep on just, you know, you, you get through one drama and then they just inflict themselves with something else and you're just thinking why on earth it makes me so angry and discouraged well take up that cross keep on pursuing the Lord Jesus it is worth the cost it is worth the cost because Jesus remains as the Christ of God 
and that is far outweighs the suffering that happens along the way. You see, he is everything to us, isn't he? Uh, as someone said, you will never see the extent of his love until you know that he is everything to you. And there is uh, blessing, there is suffering, and there is eternal glory. You see, Jesus doesn't look at the disciples and say, oh, well, uh, they've made this uh, great declaration, um, that sounds good, and what is now important is that they have peaceful and comfortable lives. Jesus doesn't do that, does he? Uh, unfortunately, you might think, uh, but he doesn't do that for you and me either. Uh, what is important is not our freedom from suffering, but that God would be pleased with us. Or to put it in the other side as it does here in verse 26, uh, that God would not be ashamed of you and of me. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. God's purpose is to show his glory. And uh, that's very strongly emphasized there, isn't it, in, in verse 26. His glory, the Father's glory, the glory of the angels. And as we think of that within this, this context, we see, well, that is what has been being displayed, isn't it? Uh, right from before Jesus was born, uh, the displays of glory, uh, the, the words of Mary giving glory to God, the angels in the field, uh, the, the light that shone around, uh, the voice from heaven, the actions that Jesus has done uh, have been revealing the glory of the Lord Jesus already. And of course, uh, in the next verses, we come to the transfiguration, the, the wonderful glory that is displayed as that, um, that veil uh, of his humanity is, is parted to see in a greater wondrous sense the glory of the uh, Lord Jesus, the, the one who is God Almighty displayed. This glory is beyond our wildest imagination. It's beyond what we could think to ask for. It is beyond what we uh, could imagine Him giving. This is glory that will be there for eternity for His people. And it includes, as we peep a little on uh, what we're going to look at in two weeks' time in the Transfiguration, it includes, in verse 31, the departure of Jesus. That is, the cross and the resurrection and the ascension of him to the right hand of God the Father. This passage, as we see it within that context of the declaration and the suffering that comes to us, is uh, not particularly difficult to understand, but it is quite hard to put into practice, isn't it? Uh, there's no problem with us declaring Jesus as the Christ. That is uh, something that we want to see. That is something that we want to be a part of. There's no problem in looking with great joy and anticipation, uh, excitement and praise uh, at the glory of the Lord Jesus, which will shine upon us in heaven. Uh, there's no problem with getting uh, beautiful, sweet foretastes of that glory in the present time. We like that. But you see the contrast and the challenge that Jesus brings here. If your purpose in life is to avoid suffering, then do not become a Christian. If it is most important uh, to, to uh, avoid suffering in your life, then, uh, the, the, and that is the, the purpose of most people within our world, then their, their purpose is... Uh, to say, well, the person who dies with the most toys in life, had the most experiences, had the most in this world, then they are the ones that win. But Jesus says, if you should gain the whole world and, lose your, and forfeit yourself, uh, that is the question that you need to be confronted with. 
if you should gain the whole world. There is more to life than just having peace, comfort and lots of toys in this present time. Uh, and the person who is so busy about gaining the whole world is like the person who is so desperately holding on to a five-cent coin that they cannot pick up the billions of dollars that are scattered around their feet. And that is the comparison, isn't it? Uh, that we want to hold on to what we see because we value it as precious. But it doesn't compare to the preciousness, the wonder, the glory of what Jesus offers to us. And we should not hold on to those things so tightly that they become an impediment to us. Martin Luther said, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing. Not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You see, this is really asking us what, you tre what we treasure. What do you treasure? Uh, where is the value in life, in eternity? John Piper said, there is nothing fuller than full and nothing longer than forever. So you cannot offer me anything better than life with Jesus. It's hard sometimes to see that perspective, isn't it? Because the new house, the new car, the new whatever ambition and dream that you have seems so clear and so obvious and so wonderful and will be so uh, uplifting to you. And yet, to have those things, to try to grasp onto them, it's nothing compared to the glories that Jesus offers uh, then, and uh, the fullness that he offers and for the length of time that he offers them. Again, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory... Hopefully that's what we're doing today. Contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Through, the, through life, through the ups and downs of life, the challenges, the struggles of life, that is the process that God is undertaking with you and with me. He is revealing the glory that is for eternity. Uh, he is doing it often through the struggles of life themselves. He is doing it by forcing us to ask those questions, uh, well, that thing was taken away from me. Was I dependent upon that? Uh, yes, well, that was being an interruption between me and my relationship with God, wasn't it? And so he is refining us. He is uh, transforming us into his image. That is what, that this is what is happening to you as if you are a child of God, and it is going to continue to happen from now until, until eternity, so that we will indeed see uh, very clearly on that day when we stand before him that in, wonderfully Jesus is the Christ of God, and so that we won't be surprised along the way when that is challenged, when it is hard, when there is a cost to following the Lord Jesus, but that we take up our cross that we deny ourselves, that we follow him. Let's pray.